Hi, welcome to module 4 which is about satellite geodesy. In this module we are trying to explain the principle of satellite geodesy, what are the different geodetic techniques in terms of historical system, Doppler techniques and laser ranging, as well as some new techniques like INSAR and satellite radar altimetry. And at the end we are talking about how we're going to observe our Earth using these different techniques and how it's affecting our environment and climate. Let's start with the geodesy. Uh, basically, geodesy is a science of measurement of the Earth. So it can be categorized in two categories. The first one is physical geodesy, where we are studying the Earth's gravitational field and its relationship to the solid structure of the planet itself. We also have geometrical geodesy, which is mostly talking about the size and shape of the Earth and uh, talking about the locating and uh, positioning mostly. But you can't really separate them from each other because they're somehow connected to each other. So if when you're talking about the gravitational Earth, we are also talking about the Earth's rotational axis and all those things which are affecting these parameters. So, yes, there is two categories, but they are related. There are a number of applications for satellite geodesy. I'm not going through all of them. You can obviously read the study book and find out more about the applications, uh, especially after the assignment one, the research you've done. You should know more about these techniques and their applications. But uh, we obviously have different uh, geodesy techniques. As I said, the very famous one is GPS. So if you look at this feature here, you see the GPS. We have very long baseline inferometry. We have a lunar laser ranging. We have satellite laser ranging. We have altimeters and DORI system. So in this lecture, we are going to talk about all of them. But most of the application of these techniques are in uh, geodetic, like talking about surveying, is geodetic surveying, geodynamic. We are uh, talking about the global geodesy. They do have application in uh, climate and environmental monitoring system. We do have application in navigation, marine geodesy, and also, um, as I said, earth sciences and other related fields that you can read about them. Now, uh, if we want to talk about geodetic techniques in more detail, we can even categorize them in three different categories, uh, whether they are airspace method or satellite-based method or inter-satellite method. What does it mean by each of the airspace method is the method that you have a ground stations and you are observing the satellite from the ground stations. When we are talking about the satellite-based method, basically satellite is observing the Earth. Is, the example is altimeters, for example, which you have the satellite which are observing the Earth or measuring the sea surface height or some, something along of that. We do have the inter-satellite method where you have one satellite is tracking another satellite. We do have the example of each of them uh, in GNSS as well, if you kind of remember from introduction to GPS. But let's talk about more about satellite geodesy itself. This picture also shows you the different techniques we had in terms of the uh, ground-based system, satellite-based system, and inter-satellite system, which we do have basically different platform tracking and monitoring each other. As I said, they have different techniques. Some of them are going back to the very old or old-fashioned techniques, with like historical system using the big cameras, taking an image of the satellite. We do have the very new techniques like Doris system, INSAR, VLBI, or very long based on radio inflammatory. We do have altimeters. All of those were the very new techniques in geodesy, which can be considered for different applications. Starting from historical system, the historical system we had in the past, it was a big camera like the one you can see on the right hand side. We used to take an image of the satellite or the flashing light on the satellite with the background of the stars. So that uh, stars can basically uh, show you the 
framework or the plane of the image or film at the time. It can be used for determining the direction from the camera to the satellite. So the hint here is these kind of techniques used to only apply for direction. So you couldn't get any distance from them. You could only get direction. So it's very important to know uh, why, we, why we started to think to change this system. Another disadvantage of this system was this system, they are very sensitive to environment, like weather factors. Uh, so you couldn't take an image if you had a foggy day, you know. So there was certain limitation of using this historical system. Obviously, you might argue that even laser system, they do have the these uh, disadvantages that can be affected by weather conditions, but I would say laser system at least gives you the precise uh, and more accurate results, which kind of opportunity to use those system as compared to this historical system. The first thing we need to know is satellite geodesy, how we're going to determine the range. To be honest, I'm not going through too much of that because this is mostly covered in GNSS to me. This is the same rule that we apply. We are uh, considering, if you can remember, phase shift techniques we used to have. So we are sending the signal to the satellite. Satellites have some kind of receiver which receives the signal. And then we can measure the range based on the phase differences that we had. So same as the GNSS data, if you can remember, we have the whole number of the wavelengths, we have the partial number, and we have ambiguity number to uh, basically find out the total distance from the satellite to the ground stations. And if we can somehow work it out the ambiguity number, it's very easy to get the range. But remember here, when you are talking about the two ways communication between the satellite and ground station, you have to divide the range by two. It's pretty much like total station EDM. When you're sending the signal, it goes to the reflector, coming back, and you're measuring the time multiplied by the speed of light divided by two gives you the range. It's the same thing, but as I said, we have like GNSS, we used to have the code range and phase, which is pretty much the same here. So you might either measure that time of flight, what we used to call it, or you might even uh, measure the phase difference for the signal to be able to determine the range. How we can find the ambiguity number? Obviously, we could uh, find that N value, which is unknown. Yep and we call it ambiguity. To find a solution for that, we can either measure with different frequency or we can measure uh, basically using the code. If you remember from GNSS, we used to get the approximate position from the code technique and then using the phase technique, we can solve the ambiguity and then find out the range. So we can even use the ambiguity search function that GNSS techniques have. So there are different ways to solve for ambiguity number here. The next technique is Doppler techniques or Doppler effect, what we call it. Doppler effect is very simple. Uh, I can give you the simple example of that, which is happening when train is passing. So the pitch of the visa of the train, as it approaches to you, as it's Getting, uh, getting closer to you, you're going to hear the sound of train more and more. And then once it's passed, then it will start to getting decreased again. So this phenomenon, we call it Doppler effect. The same principle can be applied to the satellite measurement uh, to basically get the distance from the satellite to the ground station. So if you assume the radio source is moving in a straight line at a constant speed, so we have a constant speed and also we are moving in a straight line and we are obviously transmitting the radio signals and angle theta is basically here uh, showing us the distance between the position of the satellites and the ground base station or 
here I'll call that observer, whatever is suitable for you. And then if we assume that we are getting closer, closer, and at some stage we are getting to the closest distance we have, or we can have from satellite to the ground station or the observer, and once you pass that point, then the received frequency of signal start decrease and the shift increase until the transmitter is basically is going out of your range. This process calls Doppler techniques or effect. So how it works in satellites? Very easy. Satellite is transmitting a known frequency which we call it FS here and then it can be tracked by the ground station or observer here in the image and then how we can uh, determine the range is based on the known frequency and if we know that that frequency is changing by the speed of or relative speed of the satellite to the ground station which can be find out using this formula here then we can work it out what would be the um, received frequency by the ground station and from that if we know the frequency shift we can basically interpolate that to the range calculation and find the range. Remember this technique is always applicable when a satellite or a ground station transmit a state of frequency. If you don't have such a thing you can't use this technique. What you might hear is Doppler orbiter graphy or and radio positioning integrated by satellite or we call it DORIS which is a French satellite system and uh, basically it started to be used for the precise satellite orbital determination but later on it also used for broader application including measuring the flow of the glacier which is very important for our environment especially when we are talking about the global warming these things comes to play. How Doris is working? We do have some Doris stations, more than 50 or 60 of them, located all over the place or all over the world. Uh, if you want to know about Australia, we do have two installations located in Mount Stromlo in Canberra and also there is another one in Western Australia. So you can search for them and have a look where they are. But these ground stations uh, are basically transmitting uh, two different frequency of signal, uh, which I'm going to tell you in, a, in the next slide. And then those signals, which you can see here, uh, have information about the ID number, timing information, some uh, meteorological sensor data like pressure, temperature, humidity, all those information can be transmitted using these uh, beacons or stations or Doris state. As I said, I already showed you these things, so the, uh, the only thing we can add here is just knowing that those frequency has the uh, 2036.25 megahertz and the other one is 401.25 megahertz uh, frequency signals which have been modulated by some information if you know about the modulation we've learned in GPS uh, on how we are modulating the signal with the information and I already told that what are those informations so you might say why we need to use Doris. Doris can be used to determine the orbit of the satellite, which can further be used for getting the exact or precise position of the satellite, which what we need. For example, for GNSS, we need to know uh, what is the exact position of the satellite to be used for the positioning on the Earth. So it's very important to get the precise position for the satellite. So the orbital produced from the Doris system has a centimeter level accuracy which is ideal for any satellite mission if we are talking about the, for example GNSS is even more than enough uh, and it can be used for different oceanography or topographies uh, satellite which has been listed here so you probably don't know all of those names and you don't need to know it's just showing you that this system will be used for uh, Earth's gravity fields, Earth's rotation, or getting the parameters uh, like 
or retail determination. We are also using them for uh, position, like if we are talking about GNSS, uh, we can get Doris system to calculate the exact position of the satellite on the orbit, which further help us to get the position on the Earth. Doris system consists of different parts. The first part is onboard instrument. Obviously, uh, satellite has some kind of payload receiver, uh, which receives the signals. And then we have ground beacons. As I said, they are transmitting the signal with the stable frequency, which can be used for determining the orbital parameter for the satellites. Uh, then we have control and processing center. Once these beacons are receiving the data from the satellite, they will send it obviously to somewhere else to be processed as a uh, frequent uh, base, like every often. Like it can be every few days or it can be even few hours. So the processing and control center, they process the data, they determine the orbital parameter, they send it back to those ground stations to be transmitted back to the satellites. And then we have some um, diode, which is the software on board of the satellite, which can get the velocity um, of the satellite in real time um, and is integrated to the satellite system to be used for the uh, positioning of the satellite. The number four, why I told it at the end, is because this system, uh, as we go further, is developing more and more. Now we can get the satellite uh, position up to one centimeter, which is very good. So as we go further, both satellites are improving as well as the ground beacons are improving, so which gives us the better uh, accuracy for the orbital parameters as well as the point uh, satellite positioning. How do this system is working? Uh, I told you before, but we do have a transmitting beacon which are located somewhere around the world. We have 50 or 60 of them. They transmit the signal, satellite receiving the signal, and then from the, has the progress toward the transmitting beacon somewhere along of this. The satellite getting to the, as I shown before, getting to the minimum distance from the transmitter, uh, and from the time it takes for a satellite to get to that point, as well as the frequency shift, satellite can get the position or the range or distance from the ground station to the satellite, which can be used for the orbital determination. The precise orbit determination is not the immediate task and as you go or leave it further is exactly like GNSS. If I want to give you an example, if you put the GNSS just one second, the position you get is not good. But if you leave it for an hour, you get better. If you leave it for six hours, you get even better. If you leave it forever like Holes Network, you have very precise position. It's the same rule for Doris system. If I have the Doris system, say, only for one day, it only gives you the accuracy roughly half a meter. But as you go further, like for 10 days, it gets to 10 centimeters roughly. And then for at the 30 days, it gets to accuracy of roughly five centimeters. So if you leave it more, you're going to have the better results. And we could achieve the accuracy of one centimeter in orbital determination after 30 days, I think. But you might say, once we use the DOI system to get the satellite position, now what else we can use this system for? Easy. They are like host network. They're sitting there and getting the position over and over and over and over. So if we have some position which are independent of our network system, so they are not part of the reference frames, so we can use them for monitor monitoring of geophysical deformation and volcanoes, for example, like tectonic plate movements, all those things, we can use the DORI system for them. The next geodetic technique is satellite laser ranging. It's a very powerful tool for determining the uh, center of the Earth as well as the uh, parameter for the 
international reference frame like RTRF. So uh, how it works is we have a grounded station like this image here. We have a grounded station or big telescope that they can send a powerful laser to the satellite and there is a there is a reflector in the satellite which bounces back the signal to the telescope and using the speed of the uh, light and the time it takes for the signal to go to the satellite and coming back it can measure the range from the ground station to the satellite. Some of the application of the satellite laser ranging, first of all, it is very powerful to determine determining the RTRF. We all know RTRF, which is International Terrestrial Reference Frame. It will be used for monitoring the Earth's gravity field. We also can use it for uh, determining the currents and ocean tides. Uh, we are also can use that for monitoring the tectonic plates and vertical cross deformation uh, as well as everything else like uh, determining the orbital parameter for especially for satellite altimeters which I'm going to talk about them at the end of this lecture. Another geodetic technique is very long based on radio infrometry. This technique started from uh, 1980s where uh, they started to measure the tectonic plates motion directly um, and I'm saying you voice directly but it is very useful technique especially for uh, determining the parameter for inertial reference frame. We've learned about the inertial reference frame in module 3 but uh, for the earth's inertial reference frame we have to have a very precise uh, location on the earth to be able to measure that um, change in the reference frame orientation as well as like as the earth is rotating we discussed that the reference frame also is moving so we have to be able to identify that motion somehow how we can measure it obviously using these techniques uh, which i'm going to explain in a sec uh, we can find that the earth's orientation uh, in inertial space which have been caused by the gravitational force of the sun and moon as well as um, angular momentum uh, among the solid earth, ocean and atmosphere. Now, how this technique is working? Let's have a look. If we have a celestial object here, for example, you probably don't know, but celestial object, they transmit the radio signals, which can be observed if you have the antenna on the earth. Good. And if we can say the time that we get these radio signals from the celestial object at each of those stations. So what we are measuring the time of arrival of those signals at those stations at different places. Good. If I can somehow measure that using the obviously very precise clock, in this case is hydrogen maser clock, which gives you the accuracy of one second in one million years, which is roughly 10.3 arc second. It's thousand times better than one arc second. This allows uh, us to get the relative position of these two antennas. Uh, in respect to each other, within the accuracy of plus and minus 0.2 million second or better, which is very precise. So we somehow need to have very good clocks at each of those radio telescopes, also very good clocks in between them to get the calculation of the time difference between those two antennas. Because of this, we can get the location of this antenna uh, determine up to few millimeter accuracy which is very good and this can be used uh, to basically track the real-time orientation of the earth for the inertial navigation uh, reference frame we also can use the relative changes in the location of these two antenna uh, to be used for indicating 
tectonic plate movements and regional deformation and also local uplift or subsidence. So all those things can be determined using these techniques. I already covered most of that. So let's move on. Another technique I'm going to talk about that is interferometric synthetic aperture radar or we call it INSOM. What is INSOM? Uh, remember when we were talking about GN stars, we always say that if you have a station of GNSS somewhere, which is located, like if I have a GNSS station somewhere with the obviously and it's receiving the signal, it can give me X, Y, Z like a coarse network, like continuously operating reference set system. So I have a very precise position. So if there is any change in the land, if it's going up or down, I can understand because I know the position from the previous epochs and then I can compare and find out. But the problem with GPS or GNSS is they are only located uh, in certain places. So this gives you a very good temporal resolution, but is very poor in the spatial resolution. That's why they started to think they need another techniques to have a good spatial resolution and can be integrated with GPS to give you both high temporal and spatial resolution. This technique is called INSOR. INSOR is basically used to detect the surface movement up to millimeter or to centimeter accuracy with the high spatial resolution, you don't have a station located at somewhere. Insert satellites can cover a large area and then it gives you the accuracy up to centimeter accuracy, which can you can combine with the GNSS and get a high temporal resolution and spatial resolution. Let's see how they work. Inside techniques is basically working based on the phase shift or phase difference that you can get and then from that you can get the displacement or movement of the earth. So we need to have the same area uh, scanned or imaged using the satellite in two different epochs. So it's time, time 1 and 2. So in time 1 when the satellite is passing, so it's pre s movement, nothing's wrong, we're just measuring these phase differences to get the, like if I have the wavelength and I can work it out, as you know from GNSS uh, techniques, we can, I can work it out the range between the satellite and the Earth, so I can get the distance. Next time, when the satellite goes back to the same place, if you have any Earth movement, you're going to come with the phase differences. So you no longer observe the num same number of the phases. So it's going to be phase shift or phase differences. But how it's going to look like in the products you get is different. So if you look at these two images, there are the products you can get from the inside. The, the, on the left hand side, we call it unwrap phase difference, which is in the uh, range of 2p, so phase difference wrapped into the uh, radian or 2p radians. In the, on the other hand side is the, what we call it unwrap phase difference where you some application needs these images, some can process this one, it depends which one do you use, but this one it gives you more continuously dif uh, differences for the phase shift that you can have. In this case, it's between minus 40 to 40. And you can see this area, for example, has the high, uh, uh, roughly yellow, reddish, which shows you is the more earth movement in that area. You also can get another product which gives you the exact displacement. Um, in this case, it's a displacement in millimeter. And you can see if in different time, like in 2006, 8, and 2010, obviously you have the first time and then the rest would be different from the epoch one. And you can see, for example, in this area you have some earth movement or displacement near the coastline in this case. 
The last geodetic techniques we want to talk about is satellite altimeter. Satellite altimeter mostly will be used for oceanography purpose and they are measuring the sea level uh, from the satellite. Obviously, they send a signal again, which is radar in this case, so it's not going to be infected by the weather condition. And then it will reach the water surface like this one and then it will be bounced back to the satellite so it's like a round trip and as we know we can find out the range from the C multiplied by the time divided by 2 this gives you the range if you know the height of the satellite from the ellipsoid which we know so if I subtract the height of the satellite from the range I can get the sea surface height from that, which is the height of the water above ellipsoid, reference ellipsoid. Be careful about the reference ellipsoid here, it's not always the WGS84, so it can be different, it should, we can have different parameters, some satellite altimeter they have their own reference ellipsoid, so it's not necessarily WGS84. At the end, I want to talk about earth science research. I know you might say we are surveyor and we're never going to talk work in the earth science research. But believe me or not, if you are doing some master or PhD degree or maybe if you are ended up working in Geoscience Australia, you might come across some of these techniques. And it's not because of your research, it's just we are caring about our environment and these techniques also is important for our lives like it's not only being a surveyor or not we are caring about the planet earth and it's very dynamic we do have lots of natural hazards which are threatening our lives so we have to be aware of our environmental situation and know how we can measure these changes and deformation using the different techniques which is our job and it's not only that I told you most of these techniques also can be used for the uh, precise orbital determination which is quite necessary for us as a surveyor because if we don't have a precise location for our satellites we can't even get GNSS working for us so we can't really measure our position so this picture here is self-explanatory so it shows the process of uh, how gravity, temporal change and geoid can be related, how uh, volcanic eruption can change everything and all the sea level and glaciers melting and all global warming can be seen here to me. I found it very interesting, that's why I put it here, I sourced the material obviously underneath which you can go and read through more if you are, if you are interested. So I hope you you got something out of this module so you have learned about the different geodetic techniques we already know about GNSS in previous courses I've tried to show you different techniques which are used recently and uh, I'm pretty sure in future we're gonna have more and more so it's very important for us to know these techniques and be aware of how we can use it if you choose to have or use any of these techniques for your research um, I'm more than happy to help you. Thank you.